It's good to be here in God's house this morning. We want to read in the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. This will be the text for our morning message, so you'll want to mark that and hang on to that because we will certainly be there uh, in a few minutes together. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they continued not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Bow with me in prayer. Father, again in Jesus' name we come, asking that in the moments that are before us, the only voice that we would hear is the voice of God. The only words that are spoken will be words that come from your, your heart to ours. And that whenever we leave here in a few minutes, that we will know that we have heard from you and that your message is true. So, Father, please speak. Please speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever heard a phrase or a, s a sentence or perhaps even a paragraph that you might consider to be life-changing for you? Something that someone said that just resonated with you so completely that it literally changed your life. I would suspect that if the publisher's clearinghouse people rang your doorbell today and said you're a winner, you would say yes to that question. Many of you are familiar with the movie that came out back in 2010 called The Blind Side. This was a film that chronicles a Christian family who took in a homeless young man and gave him the chance to reach his God-giving potential. The young man's name was Michael Orr, and he dodged the hopelessness of his dysfunctional upbringing and actually became the first-round NFL draft pick for the Baltimore Ravens in 2009. Uh, Sean Tui, who was the head of the house, the husband in the home, was speaking at a recent fundraiser, and he spoke about this circumstance that happened in his family that nobody really saw coming, but that actually became something that changed their family's life forever. And as he was speaking at this fundraiser, he said they were driving down the road one morning. Now, the movie portrays it at night, but he says they were driving down the road one morning, and they spotted this young man, Michael Orr, walking along the road on a cold November morning in shorts and a T-shirt. And he said whenever that happened, they passed by this young man and said his wife spoke two words that changed their life forevermore. The two words she spoke were these. Turn around. Turn around. And I want you to think about those two words this morning. For that family, those words represented more than just making a U-turn and picking up a man. It represented a change in the whole direction of their life and their experience from that point forward. Whenever God begins to pursue us in our lives... Ultimately, whenever we begin to hear His voice, I want you to know that those two words will come to you. Those two words, turn around. When our lives begin to become distant from God and God 
pursues us out of his love and his determination not to relinquish us or release us to our choices, those two words, he will speak, turn around. Now you might have heard those words in biblical phraseology like this, repent, because that's what those words mean. Those words turn around mean to repent, or repent means to turn around. So when we begin to think about that thought, that idea, if we could summarize God's message to Jonah in two words, it might be those very same two words. He's pursuing Jonah. Jonah has decided that it's in his best interest to run from the will of God, to run from the purpose of God, to run from the plan of God. And so he's taken off in the totally opposite direction that God was intending to send him. God planned for Jonah to go to Nineveh and to preach the gospel, the good news of God's grace, God's restorative grace in that city. And Jonah decided to go entirely the opposite direction. He caught a ship, and it wasn't a carnival cruise ship. It was a merchant ship. And he takes off heading in the opposite direction. And so they they get out in the middle of the sea, and the sea begins to, to respond under the direction of God to circumvent the plan that Jonah had made. And you might hear the voice of God when that storm shows up, speaking these words to Jonah, turn around. You're going the wrong direction. Your life's not headed in the direction that I planned for it to go. Your life is not living in consistency with the purpose that I have for your life. So Jonah turn around. And I want to tell you that for Jonah, repentance begins in our passage today. Because today starts for him that long journey home to the Lord. I want to say a, make a statement to you, and I want you to hear me this morning. For each one of us, a necessary awareness of God's pursuit is always meant to lead us to repentance. Whenever we become aware that God is pursuing us, we don't need to view that or understand that as God's determination to punish, but to restore. God wants to lead us to repentance so that we can return to the purpose that He's designed for our lives. So by this time, Jonah has become aware that God is indeed pursuing him. And and in this pursuit, Jonah's at a place where he has to make some response. He has to react in some way. He's figured out that he's been found out. He's figured out that he's not pulled the wool over God's eyes. He's figured out that he's not created nearly enough distance between him and himself and God for God not to know where he is. So now he recognizes the futility of trying to put distance between himself and God. So for Jonah... The passage we're in this very morning is the end of the run. So we learn a couple of things here. The first thing that we learn is this. As God pursues this rebellious prophet, the path back to God takes a very interesting turn. And it begins with what I would call an unfolding revelation by God to everyone who's involved. Look again in verse 10. Scripture says after Jonah has told them that he's a Hebrew who fears the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land, in verse 9, that the men were exceedingly afraid. The men were exceedingly afraid. So the reaction of the crew, once they learn who Jonah is, more importantly, once they learn who his God is, who he worships, and who he fears, the, the reaction of the crew is that they were exceedingly afraid. Literally, it says that they feared with a great fear. So so here they are, out here in this ship, and they're in the middle of this tempest, the middle of this severe storm, and they, they go through all these processes of trying to figure out what could be wrong, what could be causing this, and they learn that Jonah is responsible at some level for this, and so they know that God is involved. They come to realize that God's involved in this, and Scripture says they feared with a great fear. Uh, Let let me say that in a different way. They were horrified. They they were terrified. They were petrified. In their minds, they they found themselves in a place in their lives where they simply had no hope. There was nothing they could do to change the situation they were in. 
And the reason for that reaction is clear. They had come to realize that they were in the midst of a divinely initiated activity. They had come to realize that they were in the midst of a God moment. And they knew that they hadn't known this God. They knew that they were were in a place where they couldn't do anything to alter or change what was happening to them. And they realized at some level that the purpose for which God was initiating this storm was to pursue his wayward prophet and to stop him in his tracks. And he was doing this by portraying his power in an unmistakable display. And so now at this point, these seamen, these veteran sailors, these mariners who who lived their life for the the ocean, who loved that life, who, who found joy in that life, were struck with fear. And so they spoke, and they asked Jonah this question. Why have you done this? Now, now we might hear that question, and, and, and we may think that they're really just trying to ask Jonah, why have you done this? But I read this through a few times, and I thought, they've already had that answer that, that he's running from God. I think the question might be better, better understood in, in something like this. It, it might be like they were asking Jonah, What were you thinking? You you ever ask yourself that question? Usually you do that whenever there's some sort of an injury involved, right? You've done something that's created some situation where you end up bleeding or burnt. I remember one time, and some of you actually were there, uh, it was whenever we were uh, saying, saying goodbye to one of our previous staff members, and so we all were having dinner together over at one of the restaurants, and uh, I, I think I had ordered a plate that was uh, it had maybe some fajitas on it or something like that. And so there was this big, long line of people there, and the, the, the person who was serving came over and handed me that plate, and I reached out and took it. Well, it was one of those cast iron skillet kind of things with the handle on it. And so I just reached and took that. Well, you know, sometimes they put a little pad on that, that thing to, to, to make it where you can hang on to it. This time they didn't. And so I I, I took it, and I couldn't put it down until I put it down, because if I did, it would be all over everyone. So I had to hold it until I brought it over here and put it down. And whenever I I looked at my hand, it was just already starting to blister up. And I thought, what were you thinking? (laughs) You know, you've done that sort of thing, right? Well, I think that's kind of what they were saying to Jonah here. What were you thinking? What were you thinking? Back in our... Growing up years, we, we had these, this tendency on days after good rainstorms to, to try to find a, a good mud hole to see what our trucks were made of. And, and normally, there, there was this one guy, and, and we, were, we were out mudding one day, and he got stuck. And so I had, I had gone through the mud hole, and he said, I want you to pull me out. And I said, okay. Now, the mud was, was about this deep in water. And I said, but you're going to hook up the chain. Well, he goes out there and he wraps the chain around his bumper. Now, if you know anything about pulling vehicles out, you know that's probably not the place you want to hook the chain. So he said, okay, I'm ready. And so I back up and get about four foot of slack in that chain, and I hit that thing, and, and uh, guess what happens? His bumper comes with me, but his truck doesn't. And I said, what were you thinking? You know that. You know how that works. Well, I think that's kind of what they were saying to Jonah. They were saying, do you really think that if you serve a God who is the God of the sea and the dry land, that you could outrun him, that you could leave him, be disobedient to him, rebel against him, and there would be no consequence? Jonah is in the middle of the consequence. But to their credit, they are too, but they shouldn't be. Jonah's disobedience has affected him. What we see here is the haphazard fallout or the fallout from haphazard, unthinking rebellion. Jonah's rebellion has impacted a whole lot more people than just himself. So they ask him, what were you thinking? What, 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 what's going on with you? Why would you do this? And, 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 and so they then ask, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. So you think about this just for a moment. Here's Jonah, and he's the the culprit, and he knows it. They know it now. They're agreeing with it. And they ask him, 
what were you thinking? And they said, okay, what do we have to do to you to cause this to subside? What needs to happen next? That's what they were asking. What shall we do? And, and so what, what we see here in Jonah's response going forward is what I would call a frustrated resignation. I want you to know that if Jonah had had his way at this point in his heart and mind, he still would have made that trip to the destination that he had planned. He still didn't really want to go back. He didn't care to go back. He never wanted to go to Nineveh. And we'll talk about why that is a little bit later on. But the truth is that he realized at this moment in time that there just really wasn't much more that he could do other than just to, to quit running. And, and so he resigned. He, he resigned from his self-appointed response to God of rebellion and disobedience. He finally said, okay, here's what I know. God has found me. God has found me out. God has pursued me. God is in the, the presence. God is intense. And there's nothing I can do about that. So I quit. And, and, and beyond that, as he begins to respond to the question they ask, Jonah poses what I would call a terrifying solution. Notice what happens. They said, what shall we do so that the sea can become calm? And then this is what he said. Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. Boy, I tell you, I, I might have put that at the bottom of my list of options. But I'm pretty sure that wouldn't have been my first choice. I think I'd have said, let's, let's try, let's see if there's anything else. We can. And in fact, they didn't want it to be their first choice. They're going to they're gonna try their best to row the ship back to land after he tells them that. I might have put that one at the top of my list. Said, let's first see if we can get this thing back to land. We'll go from there. But the very first thing he said was this. You want this to quit, you got to get rid of me. Just throw me into the sea. That, to me, that's a terrifying, horrifying Solution. His response was recognizing that God was on his trail and following that great demonstration of God's power in hurling that storm into their path, he knew, Jonah knew, that whether it was inside the ship or out of it, that his life was at this point altogether in God's hands. His future rested in whatever God chose to do. And so the frustrated prophet just gave up and said, throw me in the sea and it'll become calm. I remember the story of a, of a preacher who spoke at a gathering that I was at when I was a teenager. My dad asked me to go, and, and, and I went, and so we, we were sitting here, and this was one of, those, one of those men's meetings. And this preacher began to talk about his life and his ministry. And he said that at a point in his life, he got so, so frustrated with trying to do for God everything that he felt like he had to do for God in order for his life to be everything that God wanted it to be. And he said he got so overwhelming because nothing was turning out right. And he said, he said, that he, he, he said these words. He said, I never will forget. He said, I went out to the cemetery where my mother was buried and I sat down by her grave. And he said, I wept before God. And he said, I began to say these words, God, I can't do this anymore. I quit, I quit, I quit. And he said, it was as if I heard the voice of God say, good, it's about time. I've been waiting on you to say that for years. Because now, since you've decided you can't do it, I can do it through you. See, some of us need to come to a place in our lives where there's a resignation. A resignation of our belief that, that any of this really rests on our shoulders. You've heard the statement, and it's a true one. God doesn't need our ability. God desires our availability. God wants us to make ourselves available to Him so that He can use us as He sees fit in His strength and in His power with His resources. And Jonah's coming to the place where he's at the end of himself. Now he has some rebuilding that needs to occur, but at least he's at the point where he's stopped the journey away from God. And then he makes a clear confession to these Seaman, he says, I know that this great tempest is because of me. What's happening here is it's on me. I own my rebellion against God. I accept responsibility. And so he recognized and acknowledged that this was about him and his resistance to God. What we see is that Jonah has come to that point where many of us 
need to find ourselves on a regular basis of coming to terms with the exact condition and position that he is in under God. And, and, and to realize that we cannot escape his love or his will. There's no place that we can go in this entire universe, in, in the entire created order, where we can get away from God. There's no place that you can find that, 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 that God hasn't already been there. And he's not present now. So, so quit running. Resign. Just stop. And say, God, here I am. Whatever you need to do or want to do, I, I can't do anything about it anyway. I'm yours. So once he owns that and has, accepts responsibility for the situation, we see a contrasting reaction that unfolds because these men who had asked the question, what should I do? They find themselves in the middle of an emotional and frantic and tragic scene. These sailors heard what they needed to do, but they didn't want to do it. Now, their response or their lack of response may have been motivated in a couple of ways. It may have been somewhat humanitarian. I mean, who actually wants to take somebody that's another human being, a fellow human being, and throw them into the sea when there's a raging storm going on? I mean, I mean, the humanitarian side of us says, we don't want to do this. And, and so they basically said, let's try something else first. Verse 13, they rode hard to return to land, but they could not because the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. So what happens is they continue now to try to overcome this storm with human strength, with human means and human measures. That They try to circumvent what Jonah has declared to them to be the express will of God by exercising their capabilities. And as you would know, this is absolutely an exercise in futility. See, the truth is that our solutions are always going to be superficial and shallow whenever we try to utilize them against the entanglements and the problems and the challenges that are caused and brought on by our rebellion and our disobedience. The best that we can mount is just a, a feeble answer when we're, whenever we, we try to stand in the face of God as He pursues us. So they realized that they weren't getting anywhere and they took radical action. And the first thing that happens is they begin this humble pleading to God. Scripture says they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have, have, have done as it has pleased you. What we see in this prayer is really a threefold prayer. And, and it's one that any of us might pray under similar circumstances. The first thing they said was this, Lord, please preserve our lives. Please cause us to be safe again. We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish. Please preserve our lives. The second part of the prayer was this. Do not charge us with innocent blood. We're, we're, we're going to respond the way that this man has indicated we should respond. But we don't really want to. We don't know if it's right or wrong. We pray, Lord, that he really is not innocent. <laughs> well, we, we, we really want him to be guilty, so this will be okay. So don't charge us with innocent blood. And then third... You've done what pleased you. We're just trying to be involved with what pleases you. That, that was their prayer. That was the, the substance of their prayer. <clears throat> and then they did the unthinkable in verse 15. It says they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. And the sea ceased from his raging. That must have been a strange moment for these, these folks, these, these sailors to do what they didn't want to do in order to get the result that they wanted to have. They didn't want to throw this man into the sea, but they did, and it produced the result that they desired. Why? Because it was God's plan for Jonah at this part of his life. And, and so they, they did this, and then Scripture says, the, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of things here. First of all, verse 10, 
If you remember when we started this journey, Scripture says, Therefore the men were exceedingly afraid. They feared with great fear. Verse 16, it says the men feared the Lord. So what's happened now is that, that the, the fear that was somewhat generic has now come to a place where, where their, their fear, it's not, a, not necessarily a terror as it is an amazing awe and wonder at this God who would create this storm, cause this man to, to be thrown into that storm, and then take the storm away. This God, in their minds, must be someone that is so powerful and so amazing that it, that it captured their hearts with awe and, and fearfulness of what He could do. We don't know in our day what fearing the Lord is about like that. Uh, there, have been, there have been so many attempts to uh, portray God as a good old fella, uh, the grandfather in the sky, all those kinds of things. But I want you to know that our God is an awesome God. He's a powerful God. And he can do what He pleases. And whether you agree with it, appreciate it, or even like it, He's still God and you're not. And He can do what He wants to do. And if it takes a storm in our lives for God to show forth His power and remind us of His love and His pursuit of us, if God wants to produce a storm, He can do it. So, these men, it says, sacrificed to the Lord and took vows. We don't have any more information about what that looked like than what we see there, but you can see that there was an acknowledgement toward God that wasn't there when they left the port. So even in Jonah's rebellion, as God began to pull him back to himself, we see that what Jonah was trying to avoid, and that is proclaiming the truth of who God is to pagan people, happened anyway. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how God's purposes are worked out in spite of us sometimes? Well, I want to leave you with three thoughts that, that speak to the idea of redirection in our lives because a redirection in our lives brings some truths to light that we need to be aware of. The first one is this, and it comes straight out of this passage. When rebellion occurs in my life or yours, it affects other people. Jonah's rebellion had thrown a group of people into the middle of a storm that by no action of their own brought them there. And Jonah said, this is all on me. So, so don't ever think that your rebellion or your resistance to God doesn't affect anybody else. We don't resist God or rebel against God and our, and our lives are in a vacuum. It affects other people. And so we need to live our lives with a realization of that and recognize that, that what we think may just be pertaining to us or causing harm in our relationship to God may in fact affect those around us. Second thing is this. Even whenever rebellion continues in our lives, when it occurs, God continues in His pursuit of us. Jonah's done everything he could to get out from under the will of God, out from under the purpose of God, out from under the plan of God, but God still pursues. And, and that's such good news to me this morning, that, that, that even, even if I, in my own heart, have come to a place where everything says, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be where God wants me to be. I don't want to do what God wants me to do. God still pursues. Why? Because of His infinite and everlasting love. God pursues us. He does. Thirdly, this is important for you to know. When rebellion occurs, there's no place that is more or less secure than another. If, if you think that Jonah was less safe in the sea than he was in the ship, you don't understand God. The safest place for Jonah to be was resigned to whatever God wanted to do with his life. The safest place for Jonah was to entrust himself to God regardless of whether the situation looked more dangerous than the one that he was in. Now, you know, most of us, we think, boy, if I had my choice between the sea and the ship, 
I want to be in that ship. But I want to tell you something. If Jonah hadn't gotten out of the ship, pretty soon there wasn't going to be a ship. And they, all, they were all going to be in the sea. There's no place that you can go that secures you more than another when God is pursuing. There's not. I, you know, we, 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 think about, we think about Peter, and, and we, we applaud him for getting out of the boat whenever Jesus came walking to him on the water. And I think probably the reason Jonah was able to do that, I mean, the reason Peter was able to do that was because he must have read the story of Jonah. <laughs> he must have come to realize, you know, in the water or out of it, it doesn't matter. God's either going to take care of me or he's not, and he's promised that he would, so I'm going to just trust him and I'm going to get out of the boat. <coughs> Jonah, Jonah's in a place here at this moment whenever he was out of that boat where he was totally, totally, isolated from any other source of protection and care except God's hand. And that's where God wants to find each one of us. Oh, oh, listen to me. We try as hard as we might to build means and methods and all kinds of mechanisms to, to bring security to our lives, to bring help to our lives, to cause us to believe that even if we're not walking after God, that, that, we're, that we're okay there. You're not. God pursues. And you're no safer in whatever ship you're building, whatever mechanism, whatever it is, whatever, whatever life you're creating for yourself, you're, you're no safer in that life than you are out of it if you're out of God's will. Come home to Him today. Maybe you're here this morning and you're one of those folks who has known about God all of your life. You've known about His Son, the Lord Jesus, all of your life, but you've never come to the place where you've acknowledged His Lordship over you. You've never said, Jesus is my Lord. I entrust my life to Him. I believe in Him. I believe in Him for the forgiveness of my sins. I believe in Him for the salvation of my soul. I'm coming to you, Lord Jesus, and asking you to save me. And you can't say, you can't sing that song, I got saved. Today, I want to invite you to trust Jesus, to give your heart to Him today. N not, not to live your life just knowing about Him, but to live your life knowing Him. T to enter into a relationship with Him that is personal and that's forever. Father, in the quietness of these moments, my prayer to you, the prayer of my heart, is that if there's anybody in this room who is distant, who has drifted from you, they're, they may be a believer, and there may have been a time when their heart and their soul was on fire for God like no one else's, but those fires have grown cold. I pray that you would draw them to yourself right now in renewal of their relationship with God, in restoration of their fellowship with God. And Father, if there's anybody here this morning that hasn't trusted you, oh, Father, would you speak to them right now? Would you cause them to be unable to resist your amazing grace and your divine love? Would you cause them and, and draw them to your Son, who's the only Savior, our Lord Jesus? We pray in His name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? <laughs>